Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is something which I feel is misinterpreted by, I hate to say it, but everybody. They don't understand the significance of what is happening today in America and actually also in Israel because their view is a view that is given by the, uh, you know, the media, the New York Times, your Post, Internet, you know, all the places that try to analyze and interpret what is happening. <clears throat> but they don't understand uh, that the only real meaning of what is happening and therefore it gives you the power to understand what will happen is the divine plan itself, obviously, because God follows the divine plan. He's not interested in what the New York Times has to say. Obviously, that is sort of like for man's consumption. That's not really what's happening. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, what is really happening based on the divine plan. So this is what's called a real understanding. You see, <clears throat> um, and I, I'd like to talk about what is today called really current events. And that is an event that is consuming America. I mean, it's all over. And that is the invasion, and that's really what it was, an invasion of Trump's home, Mar-a-Lago in Florida. And it was a spectacular invasion. Uh, and, it's, you know, people are in many ways stunned because we are looking at the home. We're not looking at the office, the White House looking at the home of Donald Trump. This is his home, right? This is where he lives. You don't get more private than a guy's home, obviously. So an invasion, and that's really what it was, of somebody's home is a statement that is not the same as if they had taken over the White House. That's the first thing to think about. And people don't understand that. Okay. I'd like to interpret that, what it really means. But besides that, to interpret what's really happening in America. And really, you begin to see what's called a map of what is really going on. Um, so, in order to understand these ideas, uh, as usual, I have to begin from the, what's called the basic information and then build from that. What is really some of the basic information, which I've said over the years, and, uh, you know, which I wish to repeat, which is very important. Because that forms what's called the basis of the uh, reasoning of what is happening. Now, we know that the, we live in a country which is called Aesop, really what we live in, as I will explain. And the Torah talks about that. You know, <clears throat> there's Aesop, and Rivka, who was pregnant, had this tremendous battle going on with an R. And she went to the yeshiva of Shem Eva, and they were the prophets in those days, find out what's going on. And she went there, and they interpreted What's happening to her? Interesting. It wasn't a medical interpretation. You know, we'd say, well, she went to see, uh, you know, uh, OBYGIN, you know, guy, and he said, well, you know, there's something going on and this and that, whatever. No. She went to the right source with other prophets, right? Because they obviously will really tell her what's going on. And they told us certain, certain things which are incredible. They said that uh, that there's Shnei Goyim Bevetneich. There are two nations. There are two embryos, but they represent two nations that will dominate the world. Shnei Goyim Bevetneich. That there are two nations that are contending with each other. One seeks to dominate over the other. Could you imagine what that? We're talking about embryos here, right? We're not talking about people. Right? We're talking about embryos and like what in the world 
is the intelligence of an embryo. But whatever it means, that's what they said. But then they said, what will be the relationship between these embryos? And the answer to that is, one nation will be greater than the other. Now what that means is obviously that they're going to vie for dominion, power, you see, and one nation will be greater than the other. So what they were really saying is that they'll never be equal. <clears throat> one nation will dominate and the other nation will be subservient and then it'll reverse. That nation will be dominant and the other nation that was subservient or rather were dominant will now become subservient. It'll be a what's called a seesaw. You know a seesaw? Both sides, up and down. Sometimes this side is up, sometimes the other side is up. But they're never equal. There's always a tendency that the weight of one will go down and the, therefore the other one goes up. So they said that the relationship between these two people are such, well, there will be a constant conflict, right, of who has what's called ascendancy, dominance. Interesting. Who these nations will be, you see? And then it says, right, that ultimately the older will serve the younger. The older nation, whoever that is, whoever comes out first, is going to serve the, the younger who comes out second. That's an incredible nouveau. We're not talking here about an opinion, you know, an opinion in the New York Times. We're talking about a divine revelation of what is to be. And many people do not understand the significance of that revelation. And this is what I want to talk about. I've talked about different parts of that nevoah, that prophecy. But I really want to talk about, you know, something which is occurring, which most people don't realize. In any case, uh, so therefore we see that the relationship between these two nations is such, right, where one will try to dominate the other. Now, of course, what it ultimately means is that one nation will represent good, Kedusha, holiness, and another nation will represent evil, right? And that's going to be the contest. Who dominates? Is it evil that dominates? Or is it the good that dominates? And there you are. This is the ultimate battle of mankind. Who is in the lead? But it's not just the lead. Like I said, it's a seesaw. That when good is up, evil will be down. Not that evil will be also. No. We're talking about the dominance of good and evil will therefore be on the, you know, the, the, the downside or the reverse. Where evil will be up, there will be the major force and the good will be down. You see, there's an, a fundamental inequality here. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, how do we understand this? What kind of relationship is that? More important, or rather more accurate, is what is the nature of the relationship between good and evil as represented by these two nations, right? What kind of relationship is that? You know, why is that? Usually, a nation is up. Everybody else is also up. Not that he's up and he's down. What is he going to be down for? Or vice versa. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, inequality, you know, there's a, you, you are what you are, finished, right? So what kind of relationship is it? That is the question. And the answer is a very important idea, you see. The nature of the relationship is called causation. That when good does good, then that causes evil to be subdued, causes it to be subdued. That's why it is down, because it's been caused to be down. And when the evil is up, right, in a certain sense, evil being up doesn't cause the good to be down. Remember, good is the cause altogether. So when the good is up, which means the nation that is good is doing the good, and that we understand that to be the will of God, mitzvot, 
right? Then that causes evil to be down, right? That's what it does. That's why evil is down, because good is causing evil to be down. I have no choice. When uh, good is down, because that's what it's doing, not because evil has made it down, because good is down, it's not doing its job. So automatically evil rises. So the, the, what, what determines the extent of the madrega, the level of evil, is where is good. That's all you have to ask. You don't have to ask where is evil, Oh, you see? You just have to ask, well, where is the good? Because the good is the cause that leads to the consequences of what happens to evil. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you now understand the secret of the relationship. Very important secret. That evil depends on good. Right? If good is up, evil is down because evil needs good to make it rise. If, however, right, the good is down, right, then evil can grow. You see? Because evil, good causes evil to grow. Wow. Like I said, very important. So all you have to ask, if you want to know what's the status of this world, there's only one question you have to ask. Where is good? And that will automatically tell you where is evil. Isn't that interesting? That's a whole different understanding of what's going on here. Right? Now, as we will see, when you take a look at today, bad news. Evil is the dominant force of this world. And most people do not understand what evil is. Evil is not merely Jews are not doing mitzvahs. It is mankind rebelling against God. See what it is. And there are many levels of evil. I mean, take a look at this world. America has become a very evil country, as I will point out and show. It's besides China, right? Besides North Korea or Iran. Most countries are evil. Why? Because evil is not related necessarily to doing a sin. You see, evil is the aggrandizement of man. When mankind seeks to overthrow God or to uh, uh, catapult themselves into a supreme position, that is evil. Because to sin is not merely to do sins against the will of God, but it's also to have a distorted vision of who you are. You think you're somebody. That's evil. And we notice that many times in history. You know? And that's why God is always the focus of mankind. Believe it or not. You don't realize something. Odom Rishim was tempted in Chava do the sin. Why? Because the Nochash, the snake said, right, and you will be like God. He can kill a kid. Wow. Right? So man dreams of being God. All sufficient. All independent. Koyachal, infinite. So mankind dreams of being God. Right? Then you have the door, um, the, the marble. Right? Where they, Peric oil, they overthrow the will of God. You see? They, well, I'm not doing what he wants. I want to do what I want. That's exactly what the Doha Mabel did. They overthrew the will of God. Right? Then we get to the next Madrega, which is who? The Dor uh, uh, HaFloga, the generation of dispersion. When they're all sitting there building a tower, because they want to kill God, basically. Isn't it, isn't it, look, at, look at the evolution of this. Adam wants to be God. The Doha Marble wants to do their own will. Tell me what to do. Right? The Doha Flogger, the generation of dispersion, Tower of Babel, they want to kill God or subdue God. So they, make them, they want to make him to a... Uh, you can think about what they wanted to do when they, if, when they would get a hold of God. That's the question. What do they want to do with him? Right? I mean, he's a pretty hard being to put in prison. I mean, yeah, it's whatever. 
But what they probably want to do is eradicate him. Get rid of him. You see, so we can do what we want. And then you finally get to the real guy, Paroi. And Paroi says, I am God. Like, what's your problem? Right? Isn't that interesting? They're all concerned about their relationship to God. And it's, it's always been that way. You see? Everything revolves around man's understanding of God himself. We don't realize how central that is to our unconscious. We don't realize. We either all dream about becoming God, right? Defying God, right? Or killing God. Or being God. We are God. Now what else is it, right? We don't realize how central that is to the psyche of mankind. Believe me, there's a lot to talk about that. In any case, but I'm giving you the fundamental understanding of what we all aspire to, you see. Now, since we now understand something very important, what is that? That God is central to what we want and desire. And therefore, what God wants is for us to subdue these feelings. Ultimately, what the mitzvahs do, you know, you can't defy God. You have to listen to him. You see, you can't uh, be God, obviously, and so on. He's one, he's omnipotent, and so on, you know. So they are not God, and so on. In any case, it's the hidden agenda of the human psyche. I'm telling you, whether you feel it or not, and it's responsible for all human beings, you know ultimately. And I don't want to go into all of it. It's a lot of different concepts involved. But it's fundamental, basic. Now, now we understand. So Rivka's listening to this prophecy. She says, by the way, there are two nations within you that are the essence of this conflict. You see? So evil is not somebody who just wants to defy God or whatever. Evil is also the aggrandizement of man. Ah, I am it. You see? And that, of course, automatically replaces God. That's evil also. So when a person does things because he's entitled to his will, oh, I, of course I can do what I want. Right? Forget about defying God. I do whatever I want. Self-complacent. Right? Of course I want because I want to do it. My will is supreme. That's an evil. We don't look at it that way. You know, a guy says to himself, you know, of course, I need a vacation. I need a vacation. Therefore, I decide that I will go on a vacation. Now, in our eyes, what's the big deal? You see, guy needs a vacation, right? And he said, I'm going to go on a vacation wherever he wants to go, right? Okay. But in the eyes of God, that's an evil. Maybe evil is a very harsh word. I should say it's against really the ultimate will of God. Why? Because the person should say, I need a vacation because I need a change of routine to energize myself so I can serve God better. There you are. That's, you can take a vacation. Nobody saying you can't. But your motive has to be different. Because the motive is the ultimate expression of who you really think you are. <coughs> so when you look at a person who's righteous, not, you don't even have to be a tzaddik, but somebody who's called an oizid, who serves God, he says, of course I need a vacation. I need a routine change. I need an energizer. You know, and part of that is to take it easy. You know, and that's the will of God. I have to be your motive, not you. And that's the classic conflict. Who's the motive, you or me? You can take a vacation, no problem. You know, I use an example which is so, uh, so common to show you how that itself can defy God. You see? Because the critical concept is, why do you want to vaca take a vacation? What's your motive? It has to be God. Interesting. Not getting into why, but that in, in the essence is what God wants. Whatever you do has to be always for me. In a certain sense, wow, God usurps all my time. 
True. Do you know why? I'll just give you a little of that. God, why is he always interfering with what I want to do? Yeah, I want to take a vacation, right? I want to eat at a great restaurant tonight. You know, the, the new restaurant just opened, great steaks. Right? And God says, no, 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 no. You, before you go, you got to check out if it's kosher. Right? And then if it's kosher, I'm sorry, you got to make a bracha. Right? And even then, you know, take it easy. Don't fill yourself up with too much gospel. You know, and come home stoned or whatever. Whatever people do when they go to real classy restaurants, you know. Uh, but the real idea is God wants himself to be central idea in your life. Why? I'll tell you why. It's one idea. Uh, because you don't realize something. In Ilam Haba, which is a future existence, there is nobody else but God. You know, we don't, you know, when you look around, yeah, it's like, what, what, eight and a half, seven and a half billion people on the planet, right? Uh, so besides me, there's a lot of people. God is not the only one in existence. A lot of people out there. But that's here. Because God has allowed the concept of other. Besides God, there are others, which itself is a created entity, without getting, because it's the inner movado. Besides God, there is nothing else. I'm going to dwell on that. But therefore, God has allowed the concept of an other to exist. But in the Mahabha, guess what? All of that is yanked, as they say. It's out. You realize in the Mahabha, there is nothing but God. There is no angels. There's no tzaddikim. Right? Forget about Moshe Rabbeinu. He's zero in the Mahabha. It's hard to believe. You know, just think of all any of the billion that you think of, they're all zeros in Ilm Habo. You see, it's only here that mankind gives you the illusion of greatness. You know, they are great in a certain way. There's no question about that. But in the terms of being, forget about it. He's the only one. And since he's the only one in Ilm Habo, and by the way, him being the only one and you experiencing that one, right? <clears throat> Is infinite pleasure without getting into why and how. So therefore God says, okay, listen, you want to experience me and have this infinite pleasure, right? Then you have to live as if you're in Oilam Haba. And just like in Oilam Haba, I'm the only one, guess what? In Oilam Haza, I'm also the only one. Measure for measure. You begin to see the logic of this, you see? In other words, God wants you to live in Oilam Haza, the same way you would live in Oilam Habo. Except here we have to go through the motion. There, it happens. Got it? So therefore, in a certain sense, we need to prepare ourselves. You see? And that's why, to the extent that you prepared yourself, <coughs> that all your motives, all your actions, all your beliefs, is all centered on God, right? That's exactly what you can experience in Oilam Habo. And that has infinite pleasure. Without getting to why, I've spoken about this in other shurim and so on. Isn't it nice and logical? Makes sense, doesn't it? You know, our problem is we don't really experience this. We don't know this. We have to believe it. Okay, but that's the test. You believe this or not? To the extent do you do the actions or not? That is the question. You see? Anyway, now that's why I've told you. The relationship between good and evil is that the good causes evil or it causes itself to rise. Good is the answer, not evil. Very important concept. So the only question you have to ever ask about how the world is doing is where's good? That will automatically tell you where evil is. It's interesting. What a simple formula, isn't it? Anyway, and by the way, uh, just to give you an example, you know, for instance, Yosef. Everybody heard of Yosef Atzadi, right? Famous story, kidnapped, gone to Egypt, slave in Egypt, in prison, the prison in Egypt, which is the lowest social class in Egypt. And all of a sudden, overnight, it's astounding, that Pusik which says, 
and and they took Yosef out of prison. He's in one pasuk that they cleaned him up, got him out of prison, and he stood in front of Paroi. In one pasuk, you had the freedom of Yosef. Wow. Why? Now remember what I said. Evil can only exist if good allows it to. It's amazing when you think about that. But what did Yosef do? What Yosef did is he resisted the temptations of Egypt. 13 years. Imagine well, how difficult. Because not only did he resist it, you realize that his family is against him. They kidnapped him. Can't go back to them, right? So here's a person that's in prison and has to be a tzaddik. And he was a tzaddik. We call him Yosef a tzaddik. Why? To imagine to be alone in Egypt, prison, all the temptations of Egypt, and believe me, Egypt had it all, right? And so on, right? Right? Promiscuous country, and so on. Egypt was the height of civilization for 3,000 years. Very interesting. The Yusuf was a tzaddik, and the tzitkos came to a point where he defied or denied Fatifa's wife. I don't want to go into the whole opinions of what that story really was. But if you think you understand what his test was with Fatifa's wife, you have no concept of what he had to do not to be with Fatifa's wife without getting into that. It's a whole different understanding, which I want to talk about. Anyway, so because of that, well, there's the good, right? Intensifying. Unbelievable. So we know the formula. It's what good does. Not what evil does. Who cares about evil? You see, right? So therefore, since Yusuf was such an unbelievable tzaddik, where Yusuf had dominion over his tithes, over himself, where he could worship God in a place of terrible evil, right, and so on, therefore it was decreed, remember, good causes evil to rise. Well, since Yusuf was such an incredible person, guess what? Good collapsed. That's why Egypt had seven year famine. You see, the famine was because the angel of Egypt, which is a sultan, that Egypt is called his Bechor, his firstborn. And that's where he invested all his evil, you know, and so on. What he did, right, is the sultan collapsed. He's starving because the sultan eats from good. I once mentioned when a person does good, he brings down Kedusha. It's a force based on the spheres. That when a person does good, and that's how it controls evil, everything has to eat from that force, called the force of the spheres. The divine force, of which we are unaware of what it really is. But when a person does good, he brings down that force to this world, you see. And the person who does good, the Jews take that good for themselves, and they become successful. If, however, the good sins, then that force also comes down, because the only way the world exists is through that force of Kedusha, or the Shefa. But that force goes to the side of bad, evil. That's why evil grows. We give them our force. That's why we call it the growth of evil. An important concept, you see. We give the force of enormous energy. We give it to the bad. And therefore, obviously, if they have the force, right, the power of dominion, they now will become great. That's how we cause. When we have access, it's called the cosmic uh, consequence. The Jews control the light or the energy of the spheres, which is the force that creates all reality. We control it. So if we do the mitzvahs, we bring it down for us. We do the averis, the sins, right? We bring it down, same thing, or we give it to the sultan. Well, that's all he needs. It's like taking a million vitamins in one shot, right? That's why we cause evil to grow. That's how we do it. But in any case, we cause it. Because the evil or the sultan needs us to give him the energy. That's the problem with the sudden. Without us sinning, he dies. Literally. He dies. Okay. So Yosef was a tzaddik. 
And because he was a tzaddik, he took the force for himself, right? Which automatically meant that the sultan is starving. But guess what? If the sultan is starving, so is Egypt, because that's its bachor. So therefore, Egypt starved. That's the origin of the force coming to uh, the Jews and not to Paroi. And therefore, Paroi became diminished. Well, guess what? If power becomes diminished, then who rises? Yosef. There you are. Isn't that simple? Simple formula. So Yosef is the one who got himself out of prison. You see, he didn't even hire a lawyer. He was his own lawyer. By understanding the formula that if you do tzitkas, if you do the acts of God, right, in, in the proper way, you will bring down that force for yourself, and that will subdue evil to such an extent where he was right on the paroi. It's incredible when you think about that. He was right on the paroi. That's how great the force of good was. Classic example of the formula in play. You know? How much time do I have? I have an hour? Orange. I'm just saying that I can go on and on and on. And it's like, it's like, hey, wait a minute. You can't go on and on and on. You've got to stop somewhere. So how you still have today? Yeah. Well, that, that, yeah, that's what the... Uh, right. Okay, so that's a very important concept, what I just said. Thirty-four minutes. <coughs> What's thirty-four minutes? That's how long you're talking about. Wow. Now, <clears throat> there's something else you have to understand. <clears throat> what is the repercussions of good? Well, it's kedusha. What does it give us? And the answer is it gives us two things that we say every morning. We don't realize that, but this is the product of Kedusha. It's called Teferis and Oiz, beauty and might. Teferis is beauty, and Oiz is might. What are they? And we say it in the Brachot, right? Oiz is Yisrael B'Gvura, right? Who girds Israel with might, right? The Oiz Yisrael B'Gvura, and he crowned Israel with beauty. Right? We, why do we pray for those two things? Because that is the result of Kedusha. That's our property. That's our Yerusha. What is beauty? Beauty is Chochmah, wisdom. That's why Oita, he crowns his with beauty. Beauty is the incredible wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to see reality correctly. Really what it is. When we say you're wise, what are, we, what are you saying? We're saying you know a lot, but more than that, what is wisdom? Right? Knowledge is knowing. Wisdom is different. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge to practical life. What do I do? You see, that's wisdom. That's cool, right? When you go to somebody who you consider wise, because you know he, has, he knows a lot, it doesn't mean he can tell you the right advice. He has to know how to apply it to the situation that you're in. That's wisdom. Got it? Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, beauty is knowledge and wisdom. It's the ability to know reality and also to apply it. This is beauty, the first. And, we, and this is a natural consequence of, 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 of Kedusha, of holiness. That's why when you want to seek advice, who do you go to? Like, what do you call the guy? Chacham. What does a Chacham mean? You don't call him a Talmud Chacham. You ever notice? Why don't you call the guy a Talmud Chacham? He is. Talmud Chacham means somebody who knows. Right? He's knowledgeable. He's a scholar. But you notice you don't call him a chacham. What do you call him? A chacham. What's a chacham? Wisdom. Right. 
That's why you call him Chacham. Because he's more than somebody who knows. He's somebody who's wise who can advise you on how to correctly apply reality to your situation. You see? Interesting. Why the Jews call the Chacham the correct term. That's really what you need. Chacham. You see? In any case. <clears throat> so, to finish is wisdom, or actually it's, it's intellect. It's knowledge and wisdom. It's got all the stuff. But the second thing is called, tif, uh, not the first, it's called oiz, might. What's might? Might is the ability to apply all this information, right, to actually put it to practice. Success is might. The ability to implement that which you know is success. The modern day terms, by the way, you know what the modern day terms are for these? You know? What is the might of American civilization? Not the might, I should say. What is the knowledge in Ferris of America? And the answer is science. Science is about the study of reality, isn't it? You know, whatever field you want. Yeah, you know, it can be a MD, medicine, biology, physics chemistry, right, anthropology, I mean, whatever it is. Science is the study of whatever aspect of reality you want to study into its ultimate causes. That's all it is, right? But if I want to apply science, what's that called? Technology. There you are. Science is wisdom or knowledge, and technology is might. That's why you walk into a store and you can't believe what's there. You know, it's not just knowledge. It's knowledge applied. In the real world, we could use this stuff. You see, you know, I mean, when you go in to a car company, you know, car dealer, you buy a car, you're looking at one of the greatest displays of technology ever offered. You have any idea what goes into making a car? The electronics, the electricity, the physics, chemistry, the computers, you know, it's amazing they only charge 30 grand. You know, I don't want to give my hint, but they can charge a fortune, a million dollars. The amount of tech, the amount of, of, of chokhmah that goes into a car, forget it. But what about a computer? What goes into making a computer? Anyway, that's the science of the world. That's the first. Yeah, the world has first. And guess what? It has technology. Car. That's the, that's the oiz, the might. And we have to have that. Because that's what Kedusha produces. Yes? But what happens if we sin? So we give existence and might. We give existence and we give status to evil. What do we give them? Science and technology. That's what we give them. You see? That's why they have it. Because we gave it to them. Because really the Kedusha should give it to us. You see? And that's what it is. But besides that, it's also, right? The Oyes can be used for tremendous evil. You see? Tremendous amount of evil. And that's also part of the dominion. And so on. So therefore, this is very important. The concept of first and always really is the product of, of, of good, Kedusha. But when we give, we cause evil to rise, we also give it, right? First and always. So that's the manifestation, you see? And since Asa and Yaakov, who are obviously the two kids fighting it out, they're fighting over what? We dominant. You see? So they're also fighting over what? They're fighting over Tversinoids, aren't they? You see? That's why, by the way, we pray for Tversinoids. You see? Because that's really the consequences of Kedusha. And more than that, we bemoan the fact, right, that Tversinoids are what? Are in the hands of the Sultan. The hands of evil. Right, you're looking at it. 
You know, when you walk down, well, I used to say this, but I, you can't use it as an example anymore, uh, and which is which is tells you what's happening. But I used to say when you walk down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, you can't say that anymore, right? Mm-hmm. But I used to use it as an example. You walk down Fifth Avenue and you see the shops. Each one is a work of art, you know? The shops, the restaurants, you know, the malls. I mean, like these places look like palaces. You know what I'm saying? That's fair noise. But they got it, not us. I always use this as an example, you know? You know, we live in New Jersey. You're not even that far, you know? There's a college not far from here called Monmouth College. Right? It's right up the road, whatever, right? Now, I don't want to badmouth Monmouth College, but it's a nobody college. Think about that. I mean, if you look at the roster of colleges, Monmouth would probably be, I mean, I don't know how many there are, a thousand, whatever, you know, it'd be at the, but near the bottom. You know, it's a nobody college. Did you walk by their campus? Check it out. That's Ferris and Oyes. It's a nobody college. It has a beautiful campus. Did you ever go to some of these colleges? Harvard, MIT, you know? Now, you take a look. That's Ferris and Oyes that we've given them. Now, what's the comparison? You take a look at a yeshiva. A yeshiva is in a place that they had to rent. Right? They don't even own the place. They had a rent, right? You know, the, the oren is probably broken. It's got to be fixed. Right? And then they're still scrounging around for the herring, for the kiddish. Right? I mean, you look at the difference between the status of a yeshiva or a shul and the status of a college. Even a nothing college is, is beautiful. You know, the halls look magnificent, majestic. Right? Why? Because they have the first anointing. We gave them the first anointing. Not that they have it for a reason, by accident. In fact, do we say this? Yes. In Tachman, we say it every day. Admosai uz kho bashvi. How long will your eyes be in captivity? Evil. This is out in your beauty. Right? Yad in the hands of the enemy. Right? This is Akhdi Yatso. How long will it be in captivity and in the hands of the enemy? Right? What is that? That's the first noise. And we actually say that. Uh, the beauty and the, and the magnificence, the success, the technology, right, is really in the hands of Goyim, not in the hands of Jews. It was once in the hands of Jews by the Beis Hamikdash. The Beis Hamikdash in the time of not so much Ezra, but in the time of Herod, was the most magnificent temple in the entire world. It was world-renowned. It was magnificent. Even if you look at a model today, you know, imagine that we don't even realize the gold. It was just phenomenal. It was, it was magnificent. You see, I'm not even talking about Kiddusha, the holiness that came out of this place, you know, uh, that's because we then had the first anointing, right? Who took it? The Romans, Aesop, took it, right? And that began, began the dominion of Aesop, Rome. That began the dominion, you see? And with the dominion comes first anointing. So we actually say that first anointing. Isn't that interesting? Right? all adds up once you understand the basic principles. See? Faith. So we now understand what the consequences of doing the will of God. And that's why in the end of time, why do you think the Mashiach is such a glorious era? If you think you understand what the Mashiach's time is, you have no inkling of what it is. And I spoke about this extensively what the Messianic era is. It's a time that we cannot imagine the greatness. And it says all the kings, you imagine, the whole UN is going to line up, right? First they're going to line up to beg forgiveness from the Melech Mashiach. Sheikh bin Yosef and Sheikh bin David. We don't even, we can't even 
conceive of that. What? Russia? China? Right? All these guys are going to line up. All the anti-Semites, their hatreds, how many people hate the Jews and so on. They're going to line up to beg forgiveness from the Jews. And then they're going to line up to be servants of the Jews. Because it's better to be a servant, like Hogar. It's better to be a servant of Avram than the queen of Egypt, because that's really who she was. Parah gave him his wife, his daughter. You see? That's how great the Mashiach will be, the Messianic era. And obviously, if that's how great it is, could you imagine, right, what the Jews will be? Where every Jew will have ten goyim that want to serve him. Not because of slavery, you see? Nobody's forcing anybody to do this because they realize that if they can contact the Jew, they will experience God. Because from the Jew issues forth the Shekhinah. And when you feel the Shekhinah, you will go bonkers. And drugs a million times more powerful than drugs. And of course, it's like a groupie. You ever see these guys hang around a celebrity? They're groupies. Why? Because they're hoping that they hang around a celebrity long enough, part of their mazo is going to rub off. Right? Or whatever's going to rub off. That's what it's all about. They're hoping if, I, if I'm, if I'm sitting, sitting next to success, maybe I'll get some of that success. Right? Could you imagine what that means when the whole world will recognize that the Jews are the elect of God? That this is a nation that did the tikkun. You can't even imagine. Billions of people who run to serve the Jews. Not because they have to, but they want to. Because that's the only way to access the drug. And the name of the drug is the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence itself. So we have no... Why and why is that? Why is such a glorious time? Because guess what? The Messianic era is the restoration of the real Teferis and Oi of the Jews. That's it. You're looking at what we could have had, should have had, would have had, right? If we would have done the will of God. And ultimately it all began to go downhill at the sin of the golden calf. That was the pivotal moment that what the Jews did. is They destroyed the beginning of the curse and oil. So in the Messianic era, what will be restored? It's not just the Mashiach, right? It's not just the revelation of the divine presence. It is <coughs> the first and oi. And that is why we cannot even imagine. You know? You know, it's funny. I once went to France a long time ago. And one of the most beautiful places you can ever see in France, you begin to realize what a king really is. I'm not talking about the White House. That's an outhouse compared to what's in France. It's Versailles. Anybody go to Versailles? You do not believe. I'm not even talking about the building. What about the grounds of Versailles? It's like, what is this? Is this mankind building? And the grounds are beyond belief. The palace is not of this world. It's magnificent. And it's not just about Versailles. I mean, there's one place called the Hall of Mirrors. It's hard to believe you're in a hall, you know. I remember Louis XIV used to bring guys, you know, the, the dignitaries to the Hall of Mirrors. Just don't press them. It, it's like stunning, you know. It's just beyond belief. And then, you know, and then I always got to kick out the fact that one of the, when you go on the tour, they take you to his bedroom. And guess what? He used to go to bed in front of people, you know. They had to watch the king. Right? The insanity of man's gaiva. I will go to bed. Anyway, you know, but the whole palace is magnificent. And this is what? The palace of one guy. That's all it is. It's one guy, you know, that was a dictator, you know, whatever, whatever, and so on and so forth. <laughs> That's Ferris and Ois, isn't it? Except it's by one guy. Could you imagine if every Jew will have that type of residence? You see? Why? Because that's the restoration of Tferes and Oiz. That goes back to the Jews. Shouldn't it? That's the natural consequence of the Shechina being among men. You see. And that's why the Beis Hamidosh 
will be something that we cannot even begin to imagine what it will be. That's the era of the Mashiach. And that is nothing compared to Ilm Habo. Nothing. You see, and so on. You can't get, get an inkling where the Mishnah says that every Jew is going to have 310 worlds that he can call his own. You know, whatever, whatever that means and so on. Man. You know, but anyway, so therefore this is a very important concept of what the consequence is of the Shekhinah, of the Messianic era, of who has this first anointing, the Goyim has it. <coughs> and like I say, Drive to Monmouth College, right up the road. You see? <clears throat> and then just drive by your local shul. Uh, you know, if you want, really want to see what, uh, you know. I'm, I mean, our shuls obviously are very pretty and so on. I'm not putting down shul, but, you know, when you compare them to some of the, uh, you know, the university's majestic halls, it's just, uh, that's really what it should, that's what Torah should be, shouldn't it? Right? Why isn't Torah in a place that's majestic? That, that, that describes the greatness of Torah. Because in the end, Torah is the only thing that goes on in the Mabo. All of this is gone. Science, technology, it's all gone. It is replaced with something that we don't even understand. You know? Just to give you an example, before I move on, could you imagine living 2,000 years ago? Right? So you'd walk into some, uh, you know, uh, emperor, and the emperor of Rome. And they thought that was maj- majestic. Uh, you know, and, and they are right. Uh, it is majestic, right? You compare it to, you know, 2,000 years ago, right? Then you compare it to today, the technology and so on and so forth, you realize it's a dump compared to what goes on today. I mean, it's beautiful in terms of the original kind of architecture, you see? Same idea. What we look at today, which is gorgeous, magnificent, and so on, you know, is garbage compared to what will be in Oyelim Habo. We have no comfort to what's going to be in Oyelim Habo. In any case, because it's a whole different type of being, it's spiritual, and, and, and it's not in any way physical or anything. Anyway, okay, so I've explained two things. The concept of evil, that we cause evil, an important concept, and without us, evil does not exist, believe it or not, you see, and the main products of uh, good and evil, of course, is personal. And we see the difference. And that's why we are in Golis. Golis is that, you know, they have the personal. We don't really have it at all, you know, and so on. Anyway, fine, that's great. Now, what we begin to realize is, wait a minute, how much... Is, uh, is there by the Goyim? And the answer is a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff that we don't even begin to understand, you know, the corporate uh, might, you know, of the whole world. You know, it's like we hear the stock market, this one goes up, that one goes down, whatever. But you, you don't realize what is coming some of these corporations, their kingdoms, you know what they are. They're not, they're not uh, companies. They're kingdoms, you know, and masquerading as a corporation. You know, like this corporation is 100,000 people. There are 100,000 people working for you. It's, it's a kingdom, an empire. You know, and we take a look at Walmart. Walmart is an empire. You know, many of these, you know, where businesses have become empires. You know, that's the first and always of the goals, you see. So if that's the case, there's something very bad here. What is that? Then the good is really trapped. Because remember, Esau, right? Very bad for us. Because the greater that they are, worse we are. Much worse. And that's why we look the way we do. That's why Israel is a tiny dot on the map. You know? And uh, some people can't even realize Israel? That's what Israel is? You know? There was once a Japanese guy so you ask somebody, you know, it's in the, in the news every day. You know, it just makes sense. We have 9 million people. And the world has almost 8 billion people. They're not even one quarter, 1% of the world's population. 
Yet, if you ever take a look at the newspaper, there's got to be an article somewhere <laughs> about Israel, either pro or against, anti-Semitic or whatever. There's got to be something there about Israel, you know. Like, why is Israel always in the map? Why is Israel always in the consciousness of the world? You see, nobody understands that. We know the answer. Because everything is all about the Jews, Israel. Because we have the connection to the spirits. We are the ones who control everything by our deeds. Of course we're the guys. Now the world doesn't know that consciously. But intuitively their soul knows that the Nisham of a Jew is different. That's one of the rises, by the way. That's one of the causes of anti-Semitism. That they intuitively feel, spiritually, there's a, there's a vast gulf that separates a Jew from a Goy. But anyway, so therefore we begin to realize that we are in a bad position. Now, let me tell you something also, which is very important. Look, the Sutton is dying. Forget about what you see out there. It's the last, what's called, throes of the Sutton. Because the Jews have taken back an enormous amount of holiness, which I have spoken about extensively in many other shur and so on, see. And the Sutton, therefore, is dying. One of the things that we do not understand, and I'm going to tell you the reason for that, and all of this will come clear, is why has the world gone crazy? We, we take a look at what's happening in America, right? America is not the same country we knew two years ago. It's astounding. What does that mean? Okay. <clears throat> but before I go into that, let me tell you this. One, is that the Sutton is dying because he's given most of the Kedusha back. So this is what's called his last reserves. It's like a nova. A star blows completely before it dies. It's able to gather up its forces, explode in a way which can outshine a galaxy. The Sutton is desperate, desperate for the sins of the Jews. Actually desperate. Therefore the Sutton, in a certain sense, has become crazy. And he's done things to this world which in a certain sense defy logic, you see. What do I mean? Let's take a look at America, you know. Mm. You know, America defies logic. What does that mean? They're no more human. America, in many ways, is led by... They're not human anymore. What does that mean? The human beings have an intuitive sense of what's right and wrong. And God did that, to, did that to us. Not only that, they have an intuitive sense of how to survive. Right? If we didn't know that, we'd never survive. Right? Well, the first thing in order to survive is, right, is, hey, excuse me, don't kill babies. What are you killing babies for? That's by obviously the future of mankind. Yet America is all for abortion, especially for this Michigan president He's a murderer. You don't realize what Biden is, and he has no concept of what's going to happen to him when he stands in front of God. Why? Biden is a Roman Catholic, and they have just denied him and that other Michigan woman, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> sacraments, which to them is the main way of getting their item harbor. Whatever, right? Why? Because they're tremendously pro-abortion. That means you can kill a kid that's a human being right up to the time of birth, right? I mean, what else is there? Just to pop out, and that's it. That's a human being. What are you doing? But right now, he's in, and in, you know, in two minutes, whatever, he's going to be out. So how do you kill this kid? Yeah, they are pro-abortion, and there's some Michigana who says that you can still kill a kid, I think it was the first 24 hours, if you and your doctor decide that's best for you. Imagine that's murder. Anyway, and they're all for it. So, so in that sense, they're murderers. Now, could you imagine, and this galls me to no end, Biden got all upset when that guy in Texas killed whatever it was, 19, 20, 21 people, right? 
a crazy guy, right? He kills people and they finally killed him. Fine. So he was all upset and trying to outlaw guns, whatever. You can't believe this. What a moron this guy is. Because guns don't kill. It's people that kill. Why don't they outlaw knives? Because knives kill too. Well, the problem with that is you can't cook without a knife, right? So uh, with a gun, you can cook without a gun, right? Uh, but the main idea is that so he got all upset at the murders, right? So he's trying to take it, he's trying to take it out on the, on, on the guns, whatever. Yeah, but wait a minute. You're concerned about murder? 21 people? Right? Do you know that what's going on in the border? In the border, right, you have millions of people running over the border, right? But what's killing everybody is the fentanyl. They are bringing fentanyl in by the tons. And fentanyl, I think, is a cardiac uh, uh, antiseptic or whatever, very powerful. It will kill you if you take the wrong amount of drops, a couple of drops, and you'll be dead. Right? 300 people die in the United States from fentanyl overdose every day. 300. Forget about 21 that one time, right? 120,000 people die every year from fentanyl overdose. And the major reason for that is the border is open for illegal immigration. So wait a minute. You look at this guy, but excuse me. You are making possible murder every day. 300, 120,000 people. You know, you're a murderer because you could stop it. You could stop this. You know how you stop it? The Mexican government can't stop it. This, this uh, basic nobody, Obrador, who's the president of Mexico, what is this guy? This guy has no concept. And the cartel is now invading Mexican cities. All right? So how do you stop this? He can't. So they can invade, they can take over Mexico. I'm surprised that they haven't taken over Mexico, the cartel. Right? Very simple. All you have to do is declare, right? Declare the cartel terrorists. That's what they are. They're killing Americans every day. Right? And the law is that with a terrorist, you don't have to take him to court. There's no due process. You kill him. Right then and there. That's what the U.S. does. So you declare the cartel to be terrorists, and guess what? You send in the U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marines. You go in and you kill them all. Very simple. You don't need trials. You don't need lawyers. You don't need nothing. But they don't do it. And that would solve the problem of 120,000 Americans that die every day imagine how many kids die and a lot of them are teenagers by the way you know because they're fooled by the internet advertising you know there are a lot of people masquerading fentanyl as yeah it's okay you get a high and all that and then they take it and they're dead imagine losing a child you know i once spoke to somebody you know and he told me his son died overdose i could hear the pain in his voice his kid died because of this, you know? So you can ask him, what do you think you should, what would you like to tell Biden? We know what he'd like to tell Biden. That Biden would go to the Shiva Medui Gehenna, to the seven lowest level of Gehenna, and stay there for an infinite amount of time. How many deaths is this guy responsible for? I'm not even talking about he's destroying the United States. Uh, so he's a murderer. You know, he's a criminal because he's taking bribes from China, you know? I, it's just beyond belief what the U.S. I'm not even talking about the fact that he's a moron and he's, and he's completely out of it and so on and so forth. He's an incredibly evil person. He knows what's going on. That's what he's doing, you see? So why did the U.S. elect this guy? You see? You know what the answer is? Most people don't realize. Because that's what the U.S. deserves. You don't sin. You don't get that unless you deserve it. God doesn't give a, a country a Biden if they are righteous. Of course not. This is a thing called justice, a thing called appropriateness. And therefore, he decided America deserves Biden. That's the appropriate leader. Leader? 
murderer, evil, abortion? Yes. So that's one indication of what is going on in America, that we have the pits in terms of a president and his White House staff. They're all like that. And the Congress and Nancy Pelosi and tragically a Jew called Schumer, whatever. Anyway, the second thing America is into, besides abortion, which is incredible, right, is kindergarten. It is now legal, and if you send your kid to public school, you are asking for monumental problems because your kid is now being exposed to the benefits, right, of transgender. You know, you tell your kid, you don't have to be a boy. You don't have to be a girl. You can either chop off or add on, depending on what you'd like. I'm, so, I'm sorry to be so crude, right? But sometimes that's the only way to understand something. That's what they're teaching kids. You see, kid goes to second grade, he's got to read a book. Johnny loves Frank. You, you, and, and this is it. We're talking about here what? A seven year old kid? What does a kid know? And this is now legal, not only legal, but it's compulsory to teach kids transgender that biology doesn't mean anything. What ever happened to America? What ever happened to reproduction? What happened to, you know, what, what God made human <laughs> beings, male and female? What is this? You see. And then to boot, that's not even enough to say that transgender is okay, you know? You can now deny your biology. You know? Guy can say, I'm not a man. I'm a woman. You know, I, I heard on the radio that some, some woman, some guy walks into a, 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 I don't know, a shower room for women, a dressing room for women. He sits down. Some guy, right? And uh, obviously, you know, and he can't throw him out because he said he's a woman. You know, and uh, I don't really want to go into the, 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 all the problem, but there was some old woman that said, I'm not taking a shower in front of you. You crazy? But you can't throw the guy out. You can be arrested, not right about arrested, but you can be hounded out of your job. You can't say he anymore or she. You got to ask them, well, what's the proper pronoun? Uh, I, you can't even make this stuff up. A person can deny. I just want, uh, you know, I have a, a student who went into a Manhattan building, he's looking for a, a man's bathroom, whatever, they pass the woman's bathroom, and on it is a sign that says, if you feel you want to express yourself as a woman, is on a woman's bathroom, they talk to men, you know, then please feel free to come in and express what you feel about yourself. He, he's like he almost fell over. Uh, yeah, they're inviting men into women's bathrooms. So you have the freedom of feeling what you really want to be. You see, I'm just waiting for a guy to walk into a woman's mikvah. Well, it's, you know, that's next. You say, oh gosh, right? Would you go to such a mikvah with a bunch of guys hanging out there? I, this is what's next. Because you can't throw the guy because the guy says, I'm a woman. You can't throw me out. I'm not a man. I'm a woman and I have a right to be here. You see? So America is into denying the biology. You ever hear something like that? That's, huh? So when you add it up all together, then there's something else which we do not realize. Besides trying to kill babies, and besides trying to destroy the youth, and besides trying to deny everybody's biology, then there's the colleges. Do you have any idea what's going on to the colleges the last 30 years, 40 years? It's all progressive, right? It's all progressive, liberal, left. All the kids coming out, and these are the future leaders, they're all communists, socialists. America's destroyed. <laughs> so they destroy the complete youth of America. So what's going to happen in 10 years, 20 years? We have no idea. And if you think it's bad now, it's only a matter of time until a mother can marry her son. Yeah, you don't realize it. Because once it's mutter, hey, it's mutter. 
So they might have time to throw a brother to marry a sister. Incest becomes permitted. Well, why not? A guy can marry a guy, right? Why can't he marry a sister? They allowed it? I, I, I'm not aware of that, but uh, to me it's logical. So what do we see? That America has reached the pits of depravity, immorality, right? And therefore, they are zeichet to Biden. They merit having Biden. But it's more than that. America is now in a war. We don't realize that. There is a civil war going on in America. We don't realize that. It's not just Biden and Pelosi and Schumer. Let me explain what I mean. Esau in the Torah, evil, has three expressions. Because Esau had three characteristics. First characteristic of Esau, right? Tremendous gaiva, arrogance. Because it says that Esau despised the firstborn. Despised spirituality, because that's really what the firstborn was. That's tremendous gaiva, arrogance. The second thing Esau had is not just the arrogance. You're missing the best part, by the way. That's okay. Not only arrogance, but Esau is minimal, fraud. He's an imposter, right? And the third aspect of Esau is taiva, is pleasure. And that is why Western civilization, who is Esau? Esau became Edom. Edom became Rome. Rome is Christianity, and Christianity is Western civilization. That's it. We are Western civilization. But since Asaph has three parts or three different characteristics, if a Western civilization has three characteristics representing the three different forms, who is the arrogance of Asaph? Communism. Russia is Russia. That's who they really are. And they were so bad that God only let them survive 70 years. That's the worst part of Esau, the arrogance of Esau, where they would defy anything. And they did. You remember what, com- what communism was? It was, like, it was like the ultimate tyranny of Western civilization. Who was the Mirma? Who was the fraud of Esau? Europe. Europe is a fraud. Why? Because Christianity is a fraud. They tell you to turn the other cheek, right? And it's your cheek that they turn. Not theirs, yours. More people have been killed in the name of Christianity than all the wars combined. We have no, you have no idea of how much Christians have killed. We're talking here about what? Pogroms, Holocaust, expulsions, inquisitions, right? Do you have any idea how many people have died in the Crusades? It was a Christian movement against the Arabs and so on? No. Millions and millions of Jews have been killed and slaughtered and an enormous amount of civilization. Christianity, in what it did historically, is one of the most evil religions ever known. I'm not even, I mean, you know, there's a lot of other evil religions, what the Arabs have done and so on, uh, Islam and so on. But what Christianity has done is for what? Because you didn't believe in Christianity, they burn you at the stake. You can imagine being burnt at the stake, all the fast in Spain, for what? Because you were not Christian? It's unbelievable when you think about that, the, the, the heinousness of the crime and so on. There you are, okay? And where is the taiva, pleasure of Esau? America. America is Esau, and it's very into taiva. Pleasure. We know that. You know, America is a tremendous country that you can enjoy any type of pleasure. There you are. Three different types. But what's the worst part of Esau? Communism. The arrogance. The atheism of Esau is communism. Right? And now you begin to understand something. Esau is back. But the Sultan is not interested in Esau as America, right? Which is Taiva, pleasure, right? No. It wants Esau as communism. 
because that's the tyranny, the evil. Take a look at this government. This government wants to become socialist or communist, right? That's really what's happening. You know, when they hire 87,000 IRS agents, right? It's not just to get money. It's to enslave and weaponize the IRS. Yeah, it's beyond belief what has happened, uh, you know. And I'm not even talking about the rest, the DOJ, right? The Department of Justice, or they call it Department of Injustice, right? What is it? It's an evil, you see. And then you're talking about the FBI, which has been weaponized. I mean, nobody trusts the FBI anymore. Who trusts the Department of Justice? And so on. And the IRS? You see, this is all Biden and his White House staff. Uh, you're talking about ultimate progression, progressive. Progressiveness is nothing more than ASOV in its worst form. America's changing. It's going from ASOV. The, the good form of Asa, which is the Taiva, okay, it's Taiva. But at least it's Taiva. I mean, you can do whatever you want, capitalist, right, democratic, and do whatever you want. No, they're now becoming, trying to become a communist nation, which is the ultimate precast oil. It's the ultimate overthrowing of God. And I just showed you how. They are defying civilization. That's what America has become. They are becoming what is called Sodom. Why did God destroy Sodom? I mean, he doesn't do that. But he didn't even bother doing it in a natural way. Like the marble. Marble was not natural. Uh, because they had become unnatural. So they deserved an unnatural way of going. That was the marble. You know, which I spoke about extensively. Sodom. They were all of this. So God said, you have become unnatural, and I will wipe you out unnaturally. And he wiped them out. In fact, they changed the name of the United States. It's no longer the United States of America. It's the United Sodomites of America, USA. You don't realize, but America is becoming communism, which is the worst form of ASOV. But who's doing this? The Sultan. That's what he's doing this. He wants to change the form of Aesop, you see, back to the original worst form, which is the incredible arrogance, defiance of God, you see. And that's really what these guys are. And if Biden has become that, it's because America deserves it, you see. And that's what's happening to America. The transformation back to its original, most horrid form. And they're succeeding. You can see that. <coughs> Fortunately, there's the Toiv Shebeisov, which I talked about. Trump. Trump is the Aesov that has done Tshuva. Because if you remember I said, Rav Yavoy Tsoye, the older will serve the younger. And ultimately, in the end, what has to happen is Aesov has to do Tshuva. That's what happens. And Trump, Donald Trump, is Aesov doing Tshuva. And I mentioned this, Gilgo, Marcus Aurelius, Antoninus, and this is all in previous Shurim and so on. In any case, so there's a civil war going on. There's a war between the good part of Asa, Trump, and the bad part of Asa, the evil of Asa, right? Which is Biden, Schumer, Pelosi, and really, Democratic Party. That's exactly what you're looking at. You're looking at the evil of Asa, the Democratic Party, as represented by these people, the DOJ, the FBI, the intelligence divisions, all of that, trying to destroy and change Asa back into its original form. Amazing, isn't it? Now, to show you how bad it is, or how much ascendancy, I will ask a question, and then you will understand Mar-a-Lago. The question is, Purim, why are there two days of Purim? You know, you have a war, right? It was a war, Persia, Haman against the Jews. Fine, okay. It was Haman against the Jews, right? And the Jews were victorious, right? So how many days of victory do you have to celebrate? One. 
It's one enemy. The enemy is who? Persia. Haman. Actually, he's the enemy. It's Haman, right? So they won. So therefore, what do you have to do? Celebrate one day. Why are there two days? Why is there regular Purim and Shushan Purim? We don't celebrate Shushan Purim, but let us show they do, right? So we have the 14th day of Adar and the 15th day of Adar. So the question is why? You only have to have one day. It's one enemy. Just because it's Shushan, so what? Have you ever think about that? Probably not. What's the answer? Why? No, not because it's an extra day. Yes, but it's more than that. Even if it's an extra day fight. No, but I will tell you. Because when you fight evil, there are two things you fight. One is the consequences or the branches of evil. You know, the soldiers. But that's not the way to win a war. You win a war by going into the headquarters and wiping them out. The only way to do it. You know, there was a legendary snake called the Hydra that had multiple heads. And as soon as you cut off, what's the Greek mythology? As soon as you cut off one head, two more grew out of its place. So there was a never-ending battle. So they finally, I think Hercules is the one that did it. That's the legend of Greek mythology. You know, they said, listen, you want to do something, you cut off the original heads. Forget about it. All the, all the other heads are just a distraction. So I don't know how he did it, but he found the original head, cut it off, and that was the end of the Hydra. Right? <clears throat> You know, you can win, you can battle soldiers here, soldiers there, but let me tell you something. The headquarters are always going to send another legion. <coughs> you got to kill the headquarters. Where were the headquarters of Haman? Tushan. So Chazal realized, wait a minute. God not only gave us permission to destroy the enemy, which is wherever they are, Haman and his followers are in Persia, right? But the headquarters is Shushan. And we wiped out Shushan. So that's an extra gezerah that shows how great the decree was of permission to wipe out evil. So good had achieved such an ascendancy that you were actually able to wipe out Homan, the headquarters, which is Shushan. That's his territory. That's where the palace is and so on, right? So Chazal realized this deserves another day because it's another add-on to the success of Xero because the Jews did tshuva. They fasted for three days. So that fasting was so great that God said, not only can you wipe out right, the extension of evil, but I'm giving you permission to wipe out evil itself, its origin headquarters. And they did. Therefore we have Shushan Purim as a commemoration of wiping out all of Homan. And that's why, by the way, you never hear of Homan again. Notice? You never hear of Homan in, in history. He's gone because they wiped out the, 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 the headquarters. Got that? Okay. Now we can understand mar lago Evil is winning. No question about that. Uh, so how does evil show you its dominance? Right? By wiping out good. But there are two aspects of good. So evil is trying to destroy Trump. Trump is the Toif Shabesov, right? So he's trying to get him desperately. January 6th, which is an insanity. Everybody knows that, right? The two impeachments. They try to get him, and now they're after him with attacks and everything. But these are all about the power of Trump. Nah, nah, nah. We want to really show you how evil we are. We are going into... Melania's bedroom and pulling out her undergarments. What is that? I hate to be so gross. But that is an invasion of the person. Without looking at an invasion of his powers, his office, right, which is everything else. His impeachment done to throw him off the presidency, right, and the tax. We're looking at his private residence. Mar-a-Lago is where the guy lives. So that shows you that evil is so great, their ascendancy is so great, they're going after his residence, Mar-a-Lago. 
right? And not only after his residence, we're going into his wife's bedroom, right? And pulling out, we're even taking his passport. <coughs> I'm surprised that they didn't go after Trump and pull his pants off. I'm sorry for being so gross. But is that not an expression of your total dominance? Right? Your total victory over good? Of course it is. That's Mar-a-Lago. Uh, people don't understand what Mar-a-Lago is. Mar-a-Lago is the absolute victory over Trump. That's what it is. It's not merely invasion of somebody's house. You don't do that. And they could have negotiated with Trump. Trump said he would give it to them. The whole thing was illegal. I don't know if you realize that. But there's a law in 1978 called the Presidential uh, I think Property Act that says a president has the right to keep his documents, even if they're classified. Because it doesn't distinguish between classified documents or non-classified. He has a right because they hold it the president's property. It, the whole thing is illegal. And not only that, they didn't have to do this. They couldn't negotiate it. They were going to give it all back, you know. And they could have had a subpoena, and that's it. What are you going to the guy's house for? You see? You have no idea what that is. Imagine it's 7 o'clock in the morning. You're banging on your door. This is what happened to Stone. And who's the other guy just happened to? Oh, what's his name? Uh, whatever. You know? And then all of a sudden, 30 FBI agents come in with guns into your house. Matters what that's just thank you. Yeah, do you believe this? What he was? What, it's it's terror, shock. Because these guys have the government authority and they have millions, they have billions of dollars for lawsuits. You will go bankrupt after a million dollars, maybe. You probably go bankrupt after a hundred thousand dollars, right? These guys are endless cash. <coughs> these guys are enemies. You can't fight these guys, and they're coming in with thirty FBI guys. With guns drawn, I mean, what, what, what are they, crazy? Because that's them saying, we're the boss. We can invade your privacy. We can pull off your pants and your wife. doesn't make a difference. That's how much control we have of you. What is that really? That God is showing America, this is how bad you've become that the bad of Asaph has now become ultimately totally victorious for the good of Asaph. And Biden is your spokesman, the murderer. He's your spokesman. America has no concept of what God is saying to America. So what he's really saying is, do tshuva. What are you guys, are you crazy? You're defying civilization. You're defying everything. Killing babies? Uh, destroying kindergarten kids, denying your biology, as they say in Yiddish, you have become sedoim. Bad news for America. Very bad. And that's one of the reasons why there's a tremendous kitrug on America and why China is overtaking America. You think it's an accident that China is overtaking America? Which they are. They want to overtake America by when? By, two, in, in, by uh, um, uh, 2049. Yeah, that's their dream. And they're doing it. And so on. <coughs> because it's a tremendous kitwood against them. And they're allowing this. Very bad news. Why is this happening? So that was the bad news. I'll tell you what the good news is. Yeah, right. Thank God for that. I mean, uh, can anybody... I look, you can deny what I'm saying, but I, I, it's so obvious, you know. Maybe, you know, what I try to do is make it crystal clear about what's happening. Nobody wants to think in these terms because it, it is so despairing and depressing beyond belief. And it hasn't touched the Jewish community as much yet. But in any case, because what God does is before he takes out evil, he's going to make them incredibly powerful. Why? Because it's one thing to vanquish an enemy that's weak. Big deal. Of course God won because he's much more powerful. 
ah, but you know what I'm going to demonstrate? I want to demonstrate how powerful I really am. Uh, so I'm going to make them supermen. And then I'm going to wipe them out. Why do you think God made Egypt so great? You know, because he wanted to wipe them out. And God does what he said. He simply says, okay, I'm going to make them supermen. Egypt is the greatest nation on earth, under Ramses. No question about that. It's unbelievable, Egypt, right? I want to show you how great I am. I'm not going to wipe out a weakling. What's the big deal? I want to show you what I am. Uh, so not only will I wipe out the greatest nation on earth, right? That's how powerful they are. But I'm going to wipe them out supernaturally with blood, frogs. I mean, can you imagine having blood and frogs and lice and animals as your soldier? Come on. I mean, it's like, what is this? This is not a war of man. It's a war of the British learner. You, you know, uh, yeah, you know, imagine life is your soldier. I wonder who the general was. Uh, you know, that's what the Bunsham does. Before he takes out a nation, he makes it unbelievably powerful, which we, we, we always do. You know, that's what he did to Rome. Made Rome the greatest nation on earth, and they wiped them out. You know, by the time 400 CE came along, they were gone. So it's not only them. Uh, you know, it's, it's all the nations, you know. Communism was an incredible nation, and he wiped it out. But the incredible thing is America wants to become Russia. America wants to change its form. Because America is a sub. You see, so it says, what's the big deal? I might as well become a sub in its worst form. And that's what you're looking at. Uh, it is satanic. Because the sub must destroy because Trump is the greatest enemy the Sutton has ever known, other than the Jews. Because they can take out Trump as the good part of Esau. His whole purpose is to help the Jews do the Tikkun, which I've mentioned many times. Therefore, they can take out the Sutton and wipe him out. And he's already significantly, the Abraham Accords, and so on. <coughs> he's already significantly <coughs> weakened. America, Aesop, he did put the Sutton in his capacity as uh, the Yetzirah, uh, which is the tempter. He's already made any American, right? Why do you think the, what is the major dynamic of America? It's not Biden. It's the hatred of Trump. Who ever heard of something like that? Why do you hate the guy so much? In American history, you never had this before. I mean, there have been some bad presidents, but come on. Nobody would. This is psychotic. People hate the guy. For what? He was really a very, he was an excellent president. He had tremendous policies that helped America. America was doing fabulous, you know. So can you tell me why you hate the guy? You know, you got so much money because of Trump, right? Oh, unbelievable what the guy. He stood up to all the bullies, all the farm powers. He stood up to China. <laughs> he stood up to Germany, he stood up to England, made NATO contribute. I mean, this guy was incredible, right? Why do you hate him so much? Because it's not America. It's a Sutton that must, thank you, it's a Sutton that must destroy Trump. Because Trump will destroy the Sutton. He doesn't realize that. I'd love to tell him. If anybody out there knows Trump, he wants to hear the MS of why they invaded Mar-a-Lago. You should know one thing. You now understand Mar-a-Lago. Who? Trump. He's coming in a week and He is? Yeah. Wow. Can I'd love to talk to him. To get me an appointment. But I'm not interested to talk to him. I want to explain to him what he is and why they hate him and what spiritually is going on. Who cares about what America says? Uh, you know, you're looking at satanic forces. And that's why they're so powerful. There's nothing that equals satanic forces. We've never seen that before. It's unbelievable. You see? It's like, oh, it's like half America hates this guy. For what? Nothing makes sense. It's, America has become completely irrational. But Americans are not irrational. They're not stupid people. The Sutton. And with the Sutton, it's existential. It's like Iran and Israel. If Israel survives, Iran dies. 
If Trump survives, it's over for the Sultan. So that's the good news. The good news is God wants to show America what is happening. And the way he does that is to show how much an evil do to Trump. Right? That's what he wants to show. You have no idea what kind of an indicator that is, and nobody sees it. I can't believe I'm the only guy seeing this. Yeah, they all say I was wrong, it's this, they should have done this, but it's an attack on the presidency. Forget about the presidency. It's an attack on, on, uh, it's an attack on who? On, on good, the good part of Asa. It's an attack on righteousness, holiness. You see? It's really what it is. Except God says, I want to show you how far you guys have gotten. And I'm doing this to destroy you. You see? And that's what you're looking at. So what can I say? Hopefully, Mar-a-Lago is the end. Because other than his wife's underwear, and I hate to be so gross, what else can you take? Think about that. I mean, like, what if, <laughs> the whole thing is insane. Uh, you know, I, it's a, you cannot embarrass a guy more than that, you know, and so on. You know, we are witnessing an existential conflict. You don't realize what's going on between Biden, who's a perfect puppet. Why do you think God kept him in business for, for 47 or 48 years? Why this moron, this murderer, right, this criminal, you know, why? And he's, like I said once, he's achieved what every politician has wants to achieve. Became a senator when he was young, right? Delaware. What kind of state is Delaware? And not only that, right? But he's achieved, became vice president. And after that, he became president. I mean, everybody dreams of this. And this moron had done it. How? But it's not Biden. It's God that needs Biden. Why? Because Biden is such a moron, right, that he can be a puppet to the Democratic Party. And it is the Democratic Party that is the evil of Aesop. <coughs> okay, I'm going to stop. I hope I clarified what all this really means. <coughs> and hopefully what the good news is, is that this is the end. The end. Okay, question. Wow. Louder. Yeah, you have to be loud. Yeah, louder. No, no, no. no, no. <clears throat> that is an excellent question, and I will answer you. Because who is the greatest enemy of the Jewish people Arab at the end of time? Arab Rav. Arab Rav, right. Who is the Arab Rav? Those Jews that want to defy God. The Arab Rav are people that say, well, the uniqueness about Judaism isn't the Torah and our agreement with God, it is Jewish culture, it is gefilte fish, Jewish literature, that's what it is. Uh, we are a nation like every other nation, except we have our own unique culture. That's the era of Rab. We are Israelis, not Jews. That's the essence of the era of Rab. And therefore they are always at the head of the defiance of not to bring Mashiach, right? So we think that Israel is a place and there is Lapid, Bennett, uh, what he calls uh, uh, um, Leibowitz, uh, right? We think they're the only era of wherever you have the battle of the Sutton, you always have the era of Rab, even if it's America. So the era of Rab has joined the ace of who? Jerry Nadler, who I heard just won, right? Oh, unbelievable. That's the evil. Nadler, and then you have Schumer, of course, who is the chief of the Air of Rob, you know, <clears throat> then Adam Schiff, right? And there are a couple of other Jews involved. So, you know, this, 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 these are the Air of Rob of Aesop, except they have joined Aesop instead of uh, the rest of the Air of Rob, you see? And that's the answer to your question. There are always Jews at the hands of the enemy, because they are the main soldiers of the Sultan. Are they reincarnations of the Erev Rav from um, Mitzrayim? Uh, that's a very good question. I suspect they are. Yes. Yes. 
So does, is God giving them a second chance to make a sequel into existence? The Zoya says that in the end of time, God is going to send back all the good people, and that's in quotes, Nebuchadnezzar, Paroi, all these guys to come and finish their job, and then he could destroy them. So they are all merit to do their job, to defy God ultimately. Uh, that's why I believe Saddam Hussein was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, that's he himself said that. He, he did. Believed, yeah. Saddam Hussein said, yeah, I'm Nebuchadnezzar. I want to, I want to take back uh, Iraq. I, Nebuchadnezzar was uh, Iraq, right? Yeah. And I said at that time, a long time ago, 1990, that he's right. He is Nebuchadnezzar coming back, uh, right, to make war with Israel and so on. And then God destroyed him and so on. He's right. I'm but these are the wrote, guys coming back. What? They wrote a bomb. Looks like they wrote. Yeah. I mean, try to guess who these guys are, you know? Like, uh, new, new, all right. So we, 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 we don't know. By the way, Trump is now taking FBI to court to sue him. Yeah. They deserve to be sued. And they, they said there was no real basis for that raid. And they said, shut the cameras so for. Trump said, yeah, yeah, shut up, means everything is recorded. What they did yeah. Oh, yeah. Coming out. Yeah. No, what they did is not only illegal, like I just said, you cannot embarrass a person more than what they did. Uh, if you want to make a guy look like a schmata or a piece of garbage, you do exactly what they did. It's no longer about the president. It's about a human. But look how she gave him the strength. They're trying to break him, and he's still standing. Back That's him. why... That is why he is, uh, he is a, the good part of himself. That's the characteristic that makes him part of himself, to defy evil. Or else he would, that's why Pence and all the other guys could never be. He was chosen to defy the evil of himself. But there's some states now that are starting to shift away from the stupidity. They're saying you can't teach these things in nursery. So this a change happening someplace. Because, because the basis of America is still good. It is being taken over and trying to be transformed by the evil of it. No, they, 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 it's the evil of Asa. Of course they're lunatics, but um, the correct uh, name is the evil of Asa. They want to change the taiva of Asa, the pleasure of Asa, back into its worst form called the gaiva of Asa. And that's really what you're looking at. They want to become Russia on the communism. It's really what it is. Why? Not because it's good, because it's dictatorship. It's a tyranny. It's man's ability to destroy and control man. You know? I have a question. So we think, we're speaking about how um, mankind was trying to rebel against God and Adam and Chava, they wanted to, open, uh, to be God and then the next one overthrowing God and then the next uh, generation... So wait, just one second. I just was... So I hope I've explained it, what's really happening. But the explanation has to always be remember, not just an explanation of this, but in the context of the whole divine plan. That's always, and you see now, how it is in, in, all within the context of the divine plan. Spread the word, what it really is. But like this year, again, If I, I'd love to tell him this. I said, look, let me tell you what you're all about. <clears throat> it's okay. Oh, yeah? yeah. Which door do I want you know Ivanka? Yeah. I used to live in Venice. I could meet Ivanka and get her to meet uh, Trump. Sure. You know what, Ken? If you know Ivanka, take a copy of this year and give it to her. Ask her if her father would like to hear further understanding of who he is. Tell him to listen. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. <clears throat> Great meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so now you were talking about how in all the four generations, uh, we wanted to be God, of a throw God, kill God, and then we announce that we are God. Right. Okay, so now this generation we live in now, we're really all of those in one. Right. Combined. That's, that's why it's the worst. That's why it's the worst. Correct. It's mem teshari tumah. But that's why, is that why mm. it, it, Hashem has to, uh, to redeem us, it has to be so miraculous because we're so low. Right. That's yeah. why, we might give the original Shia, in the Great Reset Shia, part yes. one, uh, that is why yeah, it's bringing the Shia, because we're in the Mem Teshari Tama. And the 49th level of evil is when evil is so great, right, that Mar-a-Lago can happen. Really what it is. Mar-a-Lago is the 49th level of Tama. So my question is, okay, but if you're doing good, we are doing the fun and we're trying and <clears throat> Why are we also really good? Because we're not all good. We're not. No. We, ha- we think, uh, uh, right, right? That's the ultimate delusion of man. No, we all have sins. You know that. We all have sins. I mean, you know, you know your life. You know, everybody knows what they do wrong. And God has to clean us up. So they are, evil is succeeding because that's what it's, doing evil and God wants to wipe it out we need to be cleaned up also so we are part of that called multi multi deterministic God has many purposes for one act so their act is to ultimately destroy them our act is to get cleaned up whatever we got you see what I'm saying we're not the tzaddik we think we are that's important i tell you one thing, every time I open, and I don't open the paper, I, every time I listen to the news, I say, boy, we're closer. Uh, nobody would have suspected a Mar-a-Lago. You, got, you, just, you can't even believe this. It's never happened in history uh, that this should happen to the bizillion. should happen to a president of this nature. Nobody, nobody could even dream how low can you get. Or rather, how obvious can you get that you hate this guy? And Biden signed off on this. And Clinton, with the emails, they didn't do nothing to her. What? Clinton and Hillary, all her emails, they did nothing to her. Right. That's all part of the death of evil at the end of time. Why did they just leave him alone after all these? Who? Exactly. Hey, the guy's gone. You know why? Because they're afraid he's going to come back. That's why. And I want to tell you something. They hate him. You know why? Not only because he's a... No, I was. Because he's got bodyguards, I'm sure. The reason why they hate him so much, number one, is because he's so popular. Number two, because he defies all of them. He defies the establishment. They hate him for that. They can't control him. That's why they hate him. And he won't do what they want. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but the really reason why they're afraid of him, you know why? Because <laughs> Trump will go after them. Revenge. He realized that Trump made a tremendous mistake. I've said it very often. He underestimated the power and the intensity of evil. The result, he underestimated it. He could never believe that they would try to impeach him twice over nothing. And one of them was a complete fabrication invented by Hillary. It's amazing. That was the mistake because he figured, well, he's president, what does he have to do that for? He doesn't want to create a rift in America and so on. Meanwhile, she got him. She got him in the end. She hired this guy, this low life. They lied about him. And that destroyed his presidency. Could you imagine how much he could have done extra? If he wasn't busy the whole time between himself in court, you know what that does to a president? Destroys his authority and destroys his ability to do the job. Unbelievable what they did. He underestimated what evil is. What a mistake. And now you understand what the Torah says, that there are certain things which a person does that's evil, right? I'm telling you a fundamental principle. And you will obliterate, eradicate 
destroy without the horo evil is kept from your midst. What is God saying? And then it says, Well it's a seep and last is a dova rod there. And you'll no more no longer do this evil. What is God saying? He's saying you cannot negotiate with evil. You you need to kill it like an insect. You don't negotiate with a hornet. Right? Uh, and he negotiated with it. Right. That's the mistake. You should have listened to God. You cannot negotiate with evil. You don't understand the resolve of evil. As they say, evil never hesitates to do evil. It's always the good that says, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I, it's too much. That's what destroys good. It's like, I forgot to the Lord, Lord Harrington, the British uh, guy. He said, you know, the only thing that evil needs to succeed is that the good do nothing. This is the problem. They do nothing. And that's why evil succeeds. Rabbi, you said America is showing us that we have to do both, right? Well, God is sending signals, but the... Yeah, what? So, it's really actually happening because even Democrats, after the FBI, because Trump came forward and he said, if they can do this to me, they can do it to you. Like <clears throat> well, yeah, that's a tyranny. Democrats. That's called tyranny. Right, and now there's Democrats that are saying, we don't like the Democrats. Because there's because still, the there are, still, like right, right, oh, yeah. So because not all Democrats, not, they're not all crazy. There are many Democrats that realize their party is no longer, de- you don't understand, it's not the Democratic Party. It is a takeover. The Democratic Party has become a hostage to the evil of Esau. That's really what's happening. We're not looking at a Democratic Party. It's, a, it's been taken over by, uh, by the evil of Esau. It used to be the taiva, the pleasure of Esau. Okay, fine. Uh, that's, it's got its own problem. But it's not communism. It's not a dictatorship, a tyranny. No, that's exactly who's taking it over. And that's what's so dangerous. That, that's the danger. America does not realize that we're looking here at a tyranny. Uh, you see, that's what Biden is. It's a tyranny and the Democratic Party. And that's why they will defy all logic to take you over. Why else would they have 87,000? You know how many billionaires there are in America? 700 billion. Yes. 700, basically, 700, what am I talking about? Years. 700 billionaires in America. That's all. So can you tell me why we're having 87,000 IRS agents to make sure the billionaires pay up? There's only 700 of them. Come on. What, are you crazy? Because the 87,000 are to go after you and your money and to threaten you, intimidate you. So that's one of the main ways they can threaten you, is to come in and bust up your bank account by throwing these guys out. If I tell you one thing, this November election, and you know what the problem with democracy is? I'll tell you something. Democracy is a very bad form of government. You know why? It's true that it sounds great, because then it's the people's voice. The problem is that most people are stupid. You don't realize how stupid people are. That's number one. I mean, what do you hate Trump for? He made you rich. So many people have succeeded. That's number one. The second thing, it's not because they're stupid. They have no time to think about politics. They're too busy struggling to make a living. Who's got time to follow these nitwits in Congress? Half of these people are idiots. Well, time to check on are they doing their job and not you don't realize uh, uh, that's number two they don't have time to investigate Congress so who do they depend on the media but the media has completely turned traitor they're traitors there's no media anymore it's propagandist you don't realize America has been destroyed uh, so there's nobody even checking out what's happening in Congress or oh, what Biden is doing you know, you, you can't realize the betrayal 
of these institutions to what they were before. And that's why America was able to survive, because at least the media revealed what was going on. There is no media anymore. They all become propagandists for the Democratic Party. That's the problem. It sounds nice, democracy, but it's bad. Like I said, people are stupid, you know. Instead of focusing on Trump's policies, they focus on his character. Okay, so he's not the greatest guy you love. He does tweet a lot. But look what he's doing. You know, you think other presidents had better characters? Come on, they were always votes. Really, in the end, they all were gay. They were always characters, you know. That's what a person is. Stupid. And I, therefore, I tell you, if we, if, we don't take, if, if we don't take back the House and the Senate, or if we don't take both back, bad news. Yeah, but it's the Republicans. The problem with the Republicans is what I said. They do not, under, they do not understand the evil, the resolve of evil. They're very weak. Republicans are very timid. They got rid of Liz Cheney, that crazy lady. That's because, well, okay, finally, because she was really crazy. Because I have questions back. I mean, it's, class, uh, it's astounding, Liz Cheney. I, I, I look at this woman and say, it's just beyond belief. She knew she was going to lose. The whole, the whole Wyoming is Republican. So how do you come out there? And, and, and all she does is upset on Trump. It's like nothing else matters. She never represented Wyoming at all. So of course that. You know, what are you, crazy? Stop obsessing about Trump. My God, what's wrong with you? you know, become a maniac about, about Trump, you know? But she didn't care. Because she's a, she wants to become a martyr. I went down because of Trump. And she thinks that because she was a martyr, she's going to win the president. She's, yeah, sure, right away, right? Win the president. That's all America needs is Liz Cheney for a president. Okay, so my question is... Yeah. Um, you were saying in Allahabad we have no interaction with one another. So our sole interaction is with God? No, no, I never said that. I never said we have no interaction with each other. So what, what you were saying, how we were, it's not about, it's not about... What I said was that the center of everything is God. Well, of course we can interact with each other, but it's always about God. It's always about, because he's everything. You know, he, he dominates completely all consciousness. That's what it means. So your soul will interact with other people, but only, your soul will interact with other people, but only uh, in order to serve God. Right. Okay. So then, now when we were talking about Tefere and Oz. Yes. Tefere is a Sefira. But what is Oz in the Sefira? What? What is Oz in Sefirah? If Tefere is a, is a Sefirah, what is Oz? Oh, you mean in terms of a Sefirah? Yeah. Well, Oz would be Netzach Hoi Malchus. It's all the bottom down. Yeah. Because they're the, the feet. Yeah. The feet take you where you want to go. The Not the hands. the hands. The hands perform. The feet move. Uh-huh. So the Netzach Hoi Malchus is the Oz. So that's four Sefirah is one. It doesn't make a difference. It's, they were all subservient to the upper ones. So now, during the Messianic era, um, age, God willing, will we have a Tif Edit and Oz personally? Yes. Yeah. Sure. How would we know? And how, in what way will we'll be fulfilling our, our, our total mission in life? We'll know what it is? Like, what's, how will Tif Edit and Oz um, affect me personally? Well, the first. Actually, it's more than first. It goes up the Kesser. Kesser is the crown. Yeah. Right. The, the reward or the, the uh, revelation of the Shrina is Kesser. We cannot even believe what that is. You know, it's God is going to give us a glimpse. I think glimpse is up to my word. He will give us a revelation of who he is at the greatest level imaginable, which is Kesser. That's how high it will be. And all at the same level? Well, everything else will then follow proportionately. To the person. But the, yeah, but the source will be Kesser, Arachantan it's called. Yeah, that's how great will be the revelation. And that revelation is dominant. It, it fills your consciousness, you know? Uh, we, we, like, again, there is no uh, explanation uh, that I could give 
uh, but it becomes a complete. It, it, maybe it's a. It, it's going to be an interesting uh, pa- um, uh, a metaphor. But if somebody loves somebody, imagine I hate to do this, but when you fell in love with your husband, and I have no idea what a woman does, but uh, but uh, that's probably all you thought about for the first couple of days when it hit, mm-hmm. right? That type of consciousness will be a Yumabo. So it's so I, I, that's the only that's the only metaphor that I can describe. Of you know, we call you all of a sudden you're in love with the person, especially when you meet them for the first time, and then it hits you the emotion, right? That you can't get the person out of your mind, and not only that, if you want to move the person out of your mind, it's painful. Painful, right? That's not normal. I should say it's normal. But this does, it doesn't last very long because then as soon as he tells you. Of course it's not rational, because as soon as he tells you, excuse me, please take out the garbage, <laughs> that's the end of the love, right? Not really, but anyway. <clears throat> that, but that, that consciousness or that devotion, that obsession in a, in a good way is Ulam Habo. Because there's nothing else. It's more than that there's nothing else, and therefore well, what else am I going to think about? <laughs> nothing else. No, it's not because there's nothing else, right? It's because... The only thing you want to think about is God. That's everything else is is well in Hebrew is bottle, cancelled and nullified based on that machshava. It's like well, like ask yourself, what does an angel think about all day? Is but but that sounds too intellectual. I don't want to make it intellectual, you know. It's like a primal thing. It, it's a like I, that's why I use the, the metaphor of love. It's not because there's nothing else to think about. It's painful to think about anything else because the only thing that matters is that guy or whatever, right? I said the only thing that matters, that the only thing that has meaning, significance, matters is God and because that's what you know about him, you know? And like I said, what, what do angels think about all day? God. Yeah. Right? So what, like, when you say that, though, excuse me, right? I can't even think about it for an hour, or two hours, or three hours. Like, you know, what do you do for 24 hours, right? Because they're not interested in thinking about anything else. God is intoxicating. Maybe I used to use that word. He's, it's like a drunk when he sees liquor. Goes out of his mind, you know, or a drug addict, you know. He's got to have it. He's got to have the fix, right? Same idea. But we, don't, we can't relate to that. You know, I always think about God for 15 minutes or a day, right? And that, or something it. when it happens, you know, like right. I'm thinking Hashem. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, yeah. That, that, exa- that's it. Shia Hashem, that's why Rabbi Akiva said it's Koydish Kedoshim. Because Shia Hashem is the relationship that we have with God. Why? It, it, that's not because he forces it, because it's a reality. Right now he's hiding that reality. In fact, if he would reveal about himself something more significant, we couldn't go to work. We couldn't do anything. We'd just sit here and, and just think about God. That's all we would do. So it's not compulsion, because everything else is irrelevant. It's like meaning. You know, we don't understand what. That's why I give you the analogy when you fall in love with your husband. I, I don't know what women do, but like I say, because, you know, but, uh, but it's, probably, it's probably the same thing biologically, I imagine. Suppose you ask someone, where is God? Why do you feel love all of The answer, I, which I've explained, the answer is because he wants us to earn our own Oilam Habo. We have to earn it, not free. And the way we earn it is by having a test, commandments, mitzvahs. That's what he wants. Or else he could have given it to us immediately. He didn't have to create this world along with Biden and everybody else. Right? He could have given us Oil Mahabo immediately. But he didn't. He decided that he wants us to deserve Oil Mahabo because we caused it. We made it. Not him. He makes Oilam Habo, but we made our position in Oilam Habo. That's called Namadik Super Bed of Shame. I have a whole share on that which I gave. 
among the other 554. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. 